kind of developed, especially since it is kind of fused into a, a universal lexicon, if you will, but first, I'd like to hear from Bob and Pepe about your mentors and <coughs> their backgrounds and how they did to you. So Bob, I'll let you speak first, please. Well, one of my mentors is sitting right over there, <laughs> Mr. Boucher. <coughs> um, I went to an NSCW, or, sorry, National Stage Combat Workshop in 84, I think it was June of 84. He was the one in Salem, Massachusetts. And there, I was lucky enough to meet uh, Maestro Zeri Frankenstein, Joseph Martinez was there, um, and uh, Eric was there. Was there, obviously. But the great thing about that particular work was uh, Mr. Crane came in and taught for a week. And so I got to study with him for a week. And yes, every day you heard the song. <laughs> but you didn't just hear it. Guys, one of the things you need to understand is we have so much history up here. Not, not, not so much history. These guys have got a lot more years in the European weapons than I do. And I recognize masters when I see them. And Patty was like that. He would walk onto a set, into a room, anywhere, and he just carried with him a pride of who he was, a pride of his experiences, and a pride of his teaching, which is something I think we all try to pass on. Is we are carrying a tradition with us everywhere we go, not just in a class, not just when we have a sword in our hand. And Patty exemplified that, you know, and I saw it right away. Just a, a true gentleman, just a gentleman, very gracious. I appreciated it. When I lived in New York, I went and visited him a couple times up in Stratford, uh, and didn't get to spend as much time with him as I like to, but always, again, always gracious and giving. Uh, and that's one of the things you see in all of, not just the students, the people that knew him. Uh, I don't consider myself a student. I have a correspondence to study with him that long. But definitely an inspiration. If you could meet, um, <laughs> my students only heard this several times, Cervantes once wrote, to be lucky in the beginning is everything. And so if you can meet someone <coughs> that can pass all of that on to you through the blade, and not only that, but talked about the music in the blade, you know, with the timing of the blade. And so there's so many lessons in every class. And the thing you have to do with students, participants, whatever, calling you is listen, guys, always listen, always watch the teacher. Because we're doing things we don't know what they're doing. And a good student is going to say, oh, Bob, I saw you, you know, what was that? Oh, oh yes, exactly. Go uh, home, no, you know, whatever it might be. So always watch. And that was the thing I loved about Patty. He was poetry in motion. You know, just love watching this. Um, so, anyway, anyone else want to pick it up from there? Pepe, I'd like to hear you talk about yours. Yeah, my, my mentor is uh, Eric Fredrickson, and then the privilege of Jonathan Howell and, and, and Brad Walton, those are my three mentors. Uh, Eric is special because he's my second father, and I'm the son he didn't have. Uh, I met him in 92, and he became like my big brother and my dad. Uh, he introduced me to Patty. And uh, he is specialized also in Scandinavian drama, of all things. Um, so uh, he's been one of my best friends that I talk to him every Sunday. Um, and he, he encouraged me um, to trust uh, storytelling, the story, and character, and the importance of character. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I will never. And if I may, I started off talking about David, which is the best of the work that I want to talk about David. Uh, <coughs> David's always been very supportive. And I went to his stunt workshop, early 80s, I think. I don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, and if you haven't, guys, if you have that gift, you should check it out. Because there's so much 
much information to get there that is applicable to the film industry. And that's the big difference. You know, you'll have people teaching things, but you know, you have to be careful. You can get hurt if it's not taught right, don't have the right teachers. And David's also one of those people I've been able to call and say, hey, well, you know, this is coming up and uh, they're not offering much money. Kind of thing. Should I take it? So that's what mentors are. Which leads me into the, the next subject we want to touch on is um, what about the lexicon for the stunt community? And you were just mentioning a bit of that. I'd like to touch a little more on what, what you were discussing with us. And, and literally how that changes the way we <coughs> talk about our work and community labor. Sure. Can I take 20 seconds to yeah. talk to members or something? Yes. Swashbuckling guy in the corner of the six years and choreographing the fights. And I'm hooked right there. And that fucker JP Forney, I could have been I could have been doing a, a career. Something that you inspired me. And I went, holy shit, I didn't know that was there. I dragged all, all those plays. So <coughs> I think I got around to telling you that. And and, and years later um, I got called in to assist um, with on his amazing fights for the ballet for Romeo and Juliet. And um, I think he, yeah, the jury saw whether he was drinking or not, but the point of defense broke his arm and was delayed. So I was thrust to the front of the, the, the back of the return. And then, uh, and I had to kill this choreography too much, so he kind of accepted this. Um, and um, in 89, he did Vegas and uh, met my second father, David. And um, he yelled at me, just like my dad. <laughs> God damn it, Steve. Can you wrap this up? You gotta wash those cars. <laughs> so, um, so uh, and, oh, and, um, it's funny, I, the, the coin didn't drop till now because I'm really stupid. Uh, my favorite, favorite thing is Ray Perry Baggers. I just, it's just, it's like, it's better than sex. Do you know what I mean? Like, you guys understand? <laughs> You have a more story history than I do, so I can't complete that. But, um, uh, the, the, but the coin just dropped, and it was Eric Fredrickson who taught my great three beggar. And great teachers are a curse because they make you love something in, in, in sweat. I didn't intend to go in there and love it, but the generosity and the, the infectiousness of it and the, and the support, you know, to turn around, know your shit and know you're doing it wrong, and have Eric go, that's really good. And all of a sudden, you puff up and you love it and you get better. And I learned a lot about teaching as well. So it's funny. I, I was sitting here thinking how disconnected I am to all of this and realizing that, no, we're not. We're all, we're all like this organ. And then, of course, these gentlemen become my young um, And um, so it's, but I think, but I think going back to that thing that what I love about all the instructors here, they're all students. They're all, they're, they're, they're flexible and they're learning. And, and oh my God, they, they wander into my class and I think, what are you doing here? You know, and, and they sit and smile. And, you're nice to me in spite of what I'm teaching and all that. Okay, so twenty seconds. Um, uh, the lexicon, it's interesting. First of all, these we, we like to pr to prepare for like months to teach, that's why we can seem so smart, but these surprise questions, like we don't like we don't like them very much. But um, I, they got me thinking about language and they got me thinking about um, terminology that we share and I started to think about it, it has it serves different functions it's um, and, and all of the societies have contributed enormously in terms of like the stage work of the film you do because someone can come over and make this huge trip and when you say can you carry four bind down and then and, and thrust one they know what you're talking about you know well that's this and that's this and and that creates a community and, and that shares and then some, some of it is shorthand that allows us to do our work. Then I thought of something really interesting. Some of it is deliberately obstructorous. Because tennis is really 1-1, one, 2-1, one, 3-1. One, but instead it's 15-love, 30-love, et cetera, et cetera. 
and they keep that obstreperous lexicon so the poor people don't catch them. <laughs> and then we talk about our language, and it has all of those things. And in the stunt community, sometimes I say, um, if, if Mr. Boucher was driving for me, I'd be so honored. I'd say, sir, um, if it gets bent, tap the force, we'll reset, no worries. Right? Now that story, can't even understand, you, you would understand what I said, right? And, but that's partly because everyone listening in wants to be a stunt guy, and partly because we don't want them to be. So we don't want to be a shit, right? And, uh, and, and part of it, part of it is archaic and important to us, that history and that looking backwards and, and that tribute, because in film, we still say this is the window, because they used to line up at the pay window, because when people caught on it was the last shot, they lined up to get their envelope of money, and they left, we still say window. We still say, check the gate, even though no camera has a revolving mirror anymore, there is no gate, but we still say, check the gate, um, because we proudly hang on to this language, because that's our heritage, and that makes what we do reverberate with meaning. Which is why, if you say, and I, I say this because I'm lazy, but you say, why all this historical shit? If you, if you dive in and learn the language, it will make what you do reverberate with a meaning that's greater than yourself because it reaches back thousands of years. <coughs> you can connect to that fabric through the language. So that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> I want to throw this at. Um uh, Dave now. Dave, you wrote a really interesting article in the Fight Master about the development of language within the SAD. Can you touch on that? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the language uh, comes from the French vernacular. Uh, you, you know, a lot of the, the terminology because, uh, you know, fencing was the root of what we do. And, uh, and really, it wasn't until the uh, 1960s that, you know, actors were becoming fight choreographers. And uh, so we basically used the same language, but we also invented language. Uh, and so uh, a lot of what we say today, or certainly what I say today, is things that we basically made up, you know. Uh, uh, like when I first said, action, reaction, action. That, you know, that was just something that came to my head uh, because I was trying to describe if you cued the other person, would say for, with a, for a cut, horizontally to the head, you'd cue it and that was the action. His reaction was to duck. My action was to cut where the head was, not where it is. Okay? So it was action, reaction, action. Okay? When you were making four across the body, wherever you were cutting. And so that was just something, you know, that I don't know, I just came out of my head. I said, okay, let's try this. So let's reaction, action, you know, or action, reaction, action. And we would just, you know, I remember, I, you know, when I would say certain parodies, rather, because some of my students weren't really into all the vernacular and all the terminology, I would try and make it simple for them. So I would say things like, uh, well, uh, okay, uh, the parry praying, and I would call it the watch parry, because if you, if you parry praying, and if you got a watch on your wrist, what time is it here, and the blade, that's a parry praying. Or I'd say silly things like Muscle Beach. That's very quick. You know, you know, just because they didn't, wouldn't always remember what the terminology, uh, the French terminology was. So I just made up, I just made up language, and uh, some of it stuck, some of it didn't, and some, you know, a fair amount of it's still around today. But uh, so when you talk about uh, the language and all that, we didn't all use just the French or Italian or whatever uh, language. We made it up. Yeah, Jonathan was talking about uh, Henry Marshall earlier. He had some interesting terminology. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, Tootle, 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 Toot
That's great. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm totally into this thing. Uh, actors, <laughs> actors don't really care about the French. They just want to know, am I attacking the shoulder or stabbing you in the head or kicking you in the balls, you know. <laughs> if you speak to them in the French. But it's also interesting that that course is where the heritage is really looking for. Um, yeah, Henry, yeah, he had the wristwatch parry. He had the, uh, the actors parry, which is the parry of two. Yeah, yeah that was another one called the actors parry. Yeah. The, the big parry of two of second. Uh, and, and the reason we called it that, they, they called the actors parry, is because nobody would be stupid enough to make a big sweeping parry like this <laughs> when they could just do that. Okay. <laughs> That's why. Because yeah. it looked theatrical. And then a couple, yeah. couple of cuts that I'm, I'm using, Michelle. Hello, sailor, and fuck you, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, Henry was very colourful. <laughs> <laughs> he was English. <laughs> But it, it, it was, I, know, I remember the umbrella parries and all sorts of things. <coughs> Anything that he would do bum in face, which was all sorts of strange. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I introduced rainbow parries and free willies and all that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's whatever caught an actor's attention that made him remember the mood. And uh, there are as many terms now for that as there are actors out there doing it. And if it helps an actor learn it, why not? Right? And I think these things become our favorites as well. I love the crossover. I mean, there's some definitely mentor crossover as well with Ian Mackay and Henry Marshall and that whole lovely generation that were thoroughly involved with each other at the time as well. I do have a question for you, Dave, about unarmed. Did your did some of the unarmed terminology you use or develop come from your sort of like boxing? No, no not because we can kind of trace some of the sword play, right? With, with, with no. Flesh, like not, the, not really. It, 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 uh, you know, I try to use boxing terminology because it's totally different from what we do. But uh, I, think, I think a lot of it's just what Ian Mackay passed on to me. Yeah. And then we also have an expansion of, of our vocabulary because of all the historical uh, research we've been doing. And, and Brad, here's, that's your area. You did a lot of, uh, in fact, you and I were talking about this earlier today about the footwork from De Grasse. Right. Well, uh, early on in the, the SF, um, in the society, there was very little terminology as far as footwork. It was very linear, linear very pass-oriented on that. And they had a punta reversi and a volta. And that, that was pretty, that's, I mean, pretty much what it was. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> I drew out of the Degrassi manuscript, uh, just these two little pages, and he says he puts it in there just, you know, to put it in there, but, but it, 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 it's a whole footwork system, so um, um, I used to started to use some of that information at the American Players Theater, where uh, Randall Duke Kim asked me to uh, make the fights more historically accurate because that was a kind of a, a, a thing that the American Players Theater would do. So uh, Randy Duke Kim kind of put me on that. And then when I moved to Washington, D.C., after using what we knew of the Degrassi uh, footwork patterns um, from American Players Theater, when I moved to D.C., Payson and I got together, we'd get in the backyard, we start, you know, really playing with these uh, footwork patterns. And uh, one of the things that are that have really, I think, helped a little bit is uh, actually taking that little piece from Degrassi, and you know, you have to thank Degrassi for putting it in his book because that's an example of taking something from history, right, from some dead guy, and then applying it to your own art form, and uh, to thwart, to cross, uh, to slip, you know, uh, those kind of things came from Hutton and. And, uh, and those different things, they used different terminology in their, their books. And so uh, we're not the first to, to do that, but I think it's a really great idea to <clears throat> look to the geniuses that are uh, from the past and try to draw information from them that we can use in the present. And, and everybody here, of course, studies. So I guess the next question, after we talk about who are your mentors were. What were the most important books that you brought about this art form? Uh, 
Do you have any response to that, uh, Pepe? I don't have any. <coughs> Sorry. The Art of Personal Combat, Arthur Wise. Yeah. No, I see. Hands down. Okay. So we're, we're moving forward, and one of the things that I noticed in the 1980s, um, you would have some terminology here in Great Britain, you'd have a different thing up in Canada, a different thing in the United States. It all started to come together in the 1990s. Was that more of a function of how we were becoming more intellectualized? We were all coming to train with each other and trying to figure it out? Jonathan, what do you think? It's, um, was it when we were in Niagara? What was that? 96. 96. That's when, that's when all the representatives of the societies were there. And they actually sat down and started talking about should there be a workshop language that was common to all the countries that were now turning up to these workshops, as opposed to each individual society would maintain their own uh, terminology. But it's a definitely workshop. And in England, uh, we didn't, until I came to Vegas in 91 for the, the American uh, advance, we didn't really know what was going on in America or Canada, apart from the contact with Paddy Train. So it was very interesting for us to come and find out. And we didn't do one, two, three, four, five, five, eight, six, seven, eight. We did all the French stuff. So it's that, it's that exposure, from, particularly from Niagara on, Niagara Six on, that we started to take that back into, into the English and into the British schools. Um, and so that has become a common uh, terminology, isn't it, that, that the numbering system. So that's one of the things. I have one more question before um, we kind of change the subject. It, it's, it's kind of open to anyone. Um, you each had very specific role models, but what, uh, what am I trying to say? The early system was so much of an apprentice system. Uh, our system is a little different today. We come and train at so many workshops. It's kind of forced a little more way for ourselves. But what about your mentors and, and the opportunities they afforded you that kind of catapulted you? This field into this profession, which may set the name. Uh, any, anyone who's got a comment, I'd love to hear from. Dave, how did you go from working with Ian to working with Bill uh, Hobbs? Well, well, I, I knew all those guys because they, they <coughs> were, well, I was in, inducted into the, I don't even think my British friends here know this, I was inducted into the Society of British Fight Directors. And they didn't know what to call me, and they, so they called me an overseas affiliate. And uh, so that, that, and so I had the good fortune to uh, sit in on some of their meetings, and uh, uh, that's uh, how I uh, got to have the good fortune to meet people like Henry Marshall and Hobbs and uh, Derek Ware. Who else was it there? Roy Goodell. Roy Goodell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Roy Goodell. And uh, uh, Art, uh, who was it? There was where I said him. Yeah. yeah. Who was the other <laughs> Well, Pat <Patrick> Graham. <laughs> but you know, oddly enough for me, uh, I never met Patty Crane the entire time I was there. I met Patty Crane through Gary <coughs> Fredrickson, and, uh, and so I didn't meet him, but he wasn't. A part of the, the British society, and uh, well, he had moved to Canada in the 1950s. Oh, I guess that must. Have, but I know that he was over there at times. So that's why I didn't see him. He did, but he didn't. He didn't work a lot in London. He, he decided to to move his his practice to to. Uh, I think it was Stratford is where he lived. Yeah, landed. yeah, that's he it. was brought over uh, actually by Tyrone Jeffrey. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he replaced, uh, they had a, an actor in the company, a guy named Dr. Campbell, who was in fact Canada's first fight director, real fight director outside of, he actually was a, an actor who did theatrical fights. And if you go to Stratford ever and you want to, and you have time to look up the archives, you can see his Richard III fights uh, with uh, uh, Alec Guinness, Alec Guinness playing Richard III. And the fights are pretty fabulous. So he was really good. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to act. And so they 
uh, Aaron Guthrie knew Patty and brought Patty over. And Patty was an actor and flight director in that company for 25 years. And he created a history there. And it's still there. And, uh, and he is, you know, he, terminology, he used the French terminology. Because when I first worked there, I said, what, tears? I was trying to think, what is tears? Oh, yeah, here. Jonathan, you, you, you wanted to chime in. I'm dancing. One of my big influences was actually Fred Astaire. Oh. Watching all those dancing movies. But then that mixed with the Errol Flynn and all the swashbuckling movies before the movies. Before I met anybody who did any kind of fighting whatsoever. So at the age of eight, I was that's what I was watching. That's what I, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to dance and I wanted to fight. And I kind of that what determined my life by what I was watching. And I, I know a number of my students never watch the old films because they're so much into now and what's going on. And I don't like violent so I won't watch violent films, I hate it. But I just say, look at the artistry of some of these old films. Look at, look at what's going on, the style, the panache, the form, the music, the context, everything. And bring some of that into this present life. And look at Gene Kelly's Dorothy Wolf. Yeah. That, that kind of thing is so athletic. It's just so beautiful. Well, he doesn't bother mentioning it, but Johnny was a song and dance man on the West End of London for years, so he, he knows how to step out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a treat this week for me to, to talk to, to most of you individually and to get some of the history I didn't know, get the, the things filled in. So this is your opportunity to ask living history anything you wanted to know about where, you, where the art form came from, who worked with who. If you have any questions for our panel, go, Spence. So when you talk about fish bash wash, what that means, where it comes from, was it something specific or is it a general motion? That's a howl. That's a howl thing. Yeah, English stuntman. Which much bosh. means something in a really bloody bad sort of like. Part of it is uh, yeah, like some <coughs> sixes, country eights. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a minimal, yeah, it's a minimal amount of moves that you can do in the background so that you can look as if you're working so you can earn your daily rate. <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't apply now. Uh, some, some of them are absolutely stunning now. But, it, but it definitely back in the 60s in England, it was really, really bad. And, and I definitely was involved in training up some of the Andor stuff then. And they, because they were working for Bill Hobbs, and Bill Hobbs wanted fantastic sort of We just didn't go back off. We do more swish and ting now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David will probably go along with this. If you're hired as a fight coordinator or a sword master, okay, you have to watch out for the stunt coordinator. Because if anything goes wrong, it's going to be your fault. If anything goes right, it's going to be his doing. Um, when Richard Ryan had his first film, I sent him a list of about 12 things to watch out for on the set. One, have an assistant to watch your back always. You know, two, being aware of the stunt coordinator and just went on down the line. Um, and he got back to me and he said, Bob, that was only about half the list, wasn't it? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the stunt coordinator wants all the credit. Okay. And you're a specialist and they don't understand that. But they back to what you're saying. A lot of stunt people, not all, a lot of stunt people want to be known that they can do everything. You know, they can do a sword fight, they can do a Hong Kong fight, they can do all of these things. And some of them can, but very few. And that's why we as specialists are brought in as fight coordinators uh, or as sword masters. And I hate that word. I'm not a sword master. These are the sword masters. But you know, I have to call myself a sword master. And I literally had somebody say, well, you know, we need a sword master for this job. You know, thank you. You know, the other sword master. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so it does still exist. Yeah, and some of that fish bash wash does refer back to the 
there were canned fights uh, in the 18th and 19th century, uh, where there were Seven. country six, country eights, country twelves, and everybody knew the combinations. So you just kind of walked your way through it and it became bish bash bop. But then there was also great stories out of theatrical history. Um, a lot of the actors were, were well-trained swordsmen. And Irving was doing a, uh, Irving was doing a Hamlet, I forgot who he was, who was against. But at that time in his life, he was short-sighted. So, they, they were free facts, guys. And the audience, the, the, uh, the court was fairly close to these guys when the fighting started. And every night, the court would wind up plastered against the wall because neither one of these men could see what they were doing. <laughs> Do you have another question? Go. Uh, Larry. Uh, punch, folly, or parrot punch? You hear both of those terms. Parrot punch or punch, folly? Being inside distance, offline punch. So people have been using that term for a long time. So what I like to hear is, if anyone knows the first person who decided to make an invisible parrot on the, on the opposition show, uh, <laughs> uh, because that, that saying seems to have gone. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's Oh, oh. <coughs> you can't use that term, David. We use penetrating punch, we, but, it, but it's a derivation. It's the same. It's the same. Start. Well, I don't know start. He punch the power. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I have a question for the panel. Um, what would you guys have considered the golden age of like the film fencing and cinema, like the, the range for you guys, maybe where it began, maybe where it ended, and then, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about the swashbuckling, the fencing, the Patty Crane style stuff that a lot of us are studying here, um, and then when it ended, what kind of came in after it, from a historical perspective? May I tell a Rob Roy story? Go ahead, Frank. So I was in LA teaching at Westside Fencing Center, not fencing, teaching uh, stage combat, and we get a phone call from uh, Sony Studios. They say, and excuse me, that is my voice is <coughs> going, but they said, we need someone to work the sound on this film. The director doesn't like the sound. So I get there and I said, can I see the fight scene? And it's the Liam Neeson fight scene at the end. And so you've got true basket sword against true small sword. And uh, I looked at it and I said, oh, God, it's Bill Hobbs. It's got to be Bill Hobbs. And sure enough, it was. Uh, it was uh, funny story. This is how stupid Hollywood can be, guys. So I brought some swords with me. And I said, OK, what are you using for the sound? They wanted to swish. And they said, well, for the small swords, we had the small down rod. For the big swords, we had this big down rod. <laughs> <laughs> so I pulled out an F.A.A. and they went, oh, that sounds good. <laughs> and they figured out. But uh, it was such a pleasure to work on that with their sound. Uh, those fight scenes and that film were just phenomenal, especially the one at the end, because you had two pure styles against one another. Yeah, this is kind of a tricky question to ask because it meanders into a couple of areas, but let's start off by talking about, regarding lexicon, um, there, there's a couple, for example, and I don't want to, I don't think stage or choreography combat can take the whole blame by itself, but for a long time everything was termed a broadsword, right? Uh, in the little time I've been around in this circle, I've seen that shift. I mean, for example, it was all longsword this weekend or sword and buckler. So the industry, I, in my limited, very tiny limited time, just being peripherally associated, I've seen lexicon shift. Um, and in a similar vein, like Brad's talking about Degrassi's footwork, but there are a number of other historical manuscripts and manuals where specific footwork jargon is provided. So my question is, <clears throat> um, it's very cool to see the, the industry changing, uh, but is there a mechanism for dealing with that change, uh, perhaps even being somewhat organized towards it? Because there, I, it's clear a lot of you guys are looking more and more at historical stuff, but it's not. I don't have any perception that you guys just universally decided, okay, now it's longsword. It just sort of seemed to happen by osmosis or something. Um, but when you spot things like that and you make those changes, is it a cohesive thing or is it what, what like my perception just sort of kind of happens? I think a, a lot of the terms for, for the swords came from like Weiss and Hopkins. And, yeah, and, and also uh, uh, Jackson's book, uh, Three Elizabethan Fencing Men. Right? And, uh, you know, like in Degrassi, you know, some of the terms for a broadsword, right, or a two-hand sword uh, came, you know, from folks reading these uh, source materials and then kind of using it in to teach with, I think. And uh, <laughs> there's so much really great work <coughs> happening uh, in historical swordplay around the world. There's really some really good research and, and, and movement being developed. And I think uh, the terminology will, will evolve uh, as more and more people become aware of the different, uh, you know, systems of fence and those kind of things. So I think it's an evolving thing. I don't think there's a organized <laughs> anything that will, <laughs> will, will help with the terminology because everybody's going to teach what they want to teach and what sounds good and what's fun, you know. Yeah. I uh, that's good, though. I'll talk about it later. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, but I do want to give a plug for tomorrow night. 
So the seed, the seed beans uh, panel was about looking backwards and where we've been, where we came from. Next uh, panel tomorrow night, 7.30 in this space, where is stage combat going? The MCs are going to be Spencer, Kerry, and the panelists will be Emma Claire, Ruth, Cooper Brown, Michelle, Adrian, Nigel, Bryce, Christine, and Casey. So it's going to be a really good panel, and I highly <coughs> recommend that you, you come. Uh, as we wrap this up, I want to take the privilege of, of saying thank you, and thank you all. Uh, when we talk about mentors, of course, Dave, you're my mentor, and uh, as you know. And Fredrickson, of course, has been very important in my life, but JP and John and, of course, Brad. And, I mean, you guys have taught me so much, and uh, I don't want to speak for you. Do you want to? to? I, I feel the same. I just, like Brad said, I owe so much to every interaction I've had with each of you, and I'm pretty sure even those of you who are new here start to feel that the same way. We just really are so thankful for you and the traditions that you have carried on from your mentors. They truly, uh, truly are uh, rare and special. And Bob, I love how you said that you carry around this. We carry around this treasure and pass this treasure along. Are we uh, are we going to get to see the Eric Frederick? I don't know, uh, Scott. <coughs> Maybe tomorrow. tomorrow. He's, there's perhaps some technical difficulties. He's going to move on. No, Bob. <laughs> Quick announcement, guys. In the auction, you'll see a tube. There's a picture on that tube. Uh, and we talked about generosity from this gentleman about three or four patties ago. He gave me posters that were this wide and about six foot tall of Capitano. Yeah. He and Jared tell me I've had a love affair for, with Capitano ever since I've seen you know, his book. Anyway, they are there, and there are two of them going to be auctioned off. I have to keep one myself. And yes, I asked Brad if he wanted one. He said no, auction them. So they're from Brad to me to you guys, whoever's going to buy it. They're wonderful. They're just, yeah. Okay, I know that there were a lot of questions. Um, please take advantage of this opportunity in the next couple of days to ask these gentlemen those questions. Uh, we're all here at this time. Let's make the most of it. Thank you very much for coming.